Hello and welcome to this Sutton Brain Hub video exploring pontine hemorrhage. We are going to look at this topic by asking where is the lesion and using some functional brainstem anatomy to figure it out. We're going to use a case study. So we've got a 68 year old woman who appeared comatosed on examination. Her eyes were closed and she had no spontaneous movements. Her respiratory rate was depressed and she was intubated and artificially ventilated. The neurological examination showed the following. One, pinpoint pupils. Two, absent corneal reflexes bilaterally. Three, a gag reflex that was present but weak. Four, an absent vestibulo-ocular reflex. Five, responded with bilateral symmetric and extensor posturing to painful stimuli. And six, we have a positive Babinski sign. So an emergency CT scan was performed and this showed a rather large brainstem hemorrhage. So the question we are asking here is, can we use information from the case relating to our knowledge of brainstem anatomy to figure out where is the lesion? So to do that, we're gonna take a look at the brainstem. Here is a side view. We've got the three components, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And then superimposed onto this diagram, we've got the individual cranial nerve nuclei. So understanding brainstem function can come down to understanding brainstem reflexes. So here we've got a posterior view. And first of all, let's just draw on the thalamus. Okay, so it's not part of the brainstem, but let's draw it on anyway. We've got the midbrain most superiorly. Then we have the pons. The most conspicuous part from this view, of course, is those very large middle cerebellar peduncles that join the pons to the cerebellum. And then most caudally, we have the medulla oblongata. So let's use some information from the case to see which parts of the brainstem are functional. So you might recall that we had pinpoint pupils. This relates directly to the edding of Westphal nucleus of cranial nerve 3 that sends the parasympathetics to constrict the pupil during the pupillary response. The fact that the eyes or the pupil is constricted would suggest that the parasympathetics are still intact and this would suggest unopposed action of the parasympathetics and indicating an impairment of the descending sympathetic fibres. The level of the pons is important for the corneal reflex because that involves both cranial nerve 5 and 7. The afferent limb, of course, is trigeminal, and that will involve the chief sensory nucleus seen here at the level of the pons. And, of course, the motor nucleus of 7, the facial nerve, is the efferent limb of the corneal reflex. That's absent bilaterally here at the pons, suggesting a big problem with the pons. Further down in the medulla, we have two cranial nerve nuclei, or two cranial nerves, I should say, responsible for the gag reflex. That's cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10. So 9 is the afferent limb and 10 is the efferent limb. And this is present but weak. So both the nuclei here are relating to nucleus ambiguous. So that is a nucleus that is shared by both cranial nerve 9 and 10 at the level of the medulla. So it's weak but present, indicating function at the level of the medulla. So next, we can think about the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So to understand how this actually works in the case, let's try and appreciate normal vestibulo-ocular function. The function is there to stabilize the visual image. So for example, if we move or turn our head to the right, our eyes will move to the left at a similar speed to stabilize the image. This can be quite useful in understanding the unconscious patient because it does not depend on visual input and therefore the eyes can be closed. The actual test is called the caloric test and it involves either irrigating the external auditory canal with either cold or warm water. In this example, as seen in the diagram, we're using warm water, which would mean that the temperature would need to be 44 degrees C or above. And this would mimic the turning of the head to the ipsilateral side. So in this example, as seen on the image, you can see the warm water is going into the right-hand side as the patient faces you, and that would indicate the movement of the head to the ipsilateral side, also the right side, and therefore we would expect eye movement to the contralateral side, the opposite side, in this case, the left side. So an absent vestibular ocular reflex, so no eye movement would signify a very poor prognosis and is usually as an indicator for brainstem death. 
So let's now move on and talk about posturing. Now you might recall from the case that the patient presented with extensor posturing, which is also known as decerebrate posturing and seen in the bottom image here. We are comparing that with the image above, which is the cortica or flexor posturing. The main difference is the flexion at the elbow, which brings the forearm across the chest with the hands meeting and flexion at the wrist. So why is this important? What what does the posturing indicate about the prognosis of the patient? Well, the activity of the brainstem nuclei can be useful in determining levels of impairment in a comatose patient. When impairment occurs below the level of the red nucleus, which of course is at the level of the midbrain, the result is decerebrate posturing in response to a painful stimulus. This is due to the interruption of extrapyramidal fibers controlling extensor inhibition. If the brainstem lesion is located above the red nucleus then decorticate posturing occurs. This means that the red nucleus is unaffected and still able to influence flexor facilitation via the rubrospinal tract. Now clinically a change from decerebrate to decorticate posturing equals an improvement in the patient and an altogether better prognosis than the other way around. So a transition to to the decerebrate state signifies worsening of the condition and suggesting it is becoming increasingly more life-threatening. This is because of the impact on vital cardiovascular centers in the medulla. So the final issue in this case was that we had a positive Babinski sign. This just tells us for it something very generic, which is that we have an upper motor neuron lesion. So this is the plantar reflex where we would stroke the undersurface of the foot with a blunt object. The normal plantar response would be that the toes would curve downwards and inwards and the foot would invert. This is seen in healthy adults. A positive Babinski sign would see that the big toe would dorsiflex, i.e. move upwards, and the rest of the toes would fan out, and this is an abnormal response or a positive Babinski. So hopefully all of the signs that we've seen relate to an understanding of the brainstem, and we have determined that the midbrain was healthy, the medulla was just about healthy, the problem was within the pons, and so therefore, because of bilateral problems in the pons, that we had a large pontine hemorrhage. Subscribe to Soton Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.